All right, I'm gonna show you one of the dangers coming out here to these old mines, especially in summertime. You have a tendency to find these guys. Now he's sleeping right now, but if you look at his head, he's coiled and ready to strike. Now he's sleeping right now, but that don't mean he can wake up. Watch where you're walking and where you're putting your hands at, because that's that time of year. All right, there's the mine we're gonna be heading up to today. Look at those clouds. Ooh, I'm hungry. I could go for a snack right about now. Ooh. Oh, yeah, look what I got. Just like Mama used to make, huh? <laughs> yeah. Big old pipe sticking up out of the ground. You know what that's for, huh? Now, if you think you know what that thing is for, why don't you leave me a comment down below? I know what it is, but do you know what it is? Oh, this beautiful looking andesite. And basalt. Of course, I don't care much for basalt. All right, you can see where they're cutting in the diabase right here. Diabase and basalt are similar, but that's what it looks like. It's black, fine grain, very little silica. It's in the mafic category. Now, if you haven't seen my video on identifying rocks, especially out here in the Arizona desert, check out that card right up there. Go ahead and click that, and it'll give you a brief explanation of all these different terms that I'm going to be using in the video. It's very important for you to understand this. If you're going to come out here and prospect, and you're going to see this in the waste rock piles. All right, let's get on up there, and then I'll explain some more as I go. Now, you can see where the quartz vein runs along the hill, all the way down there then you can see where there's another mine down there and what do we have in the background that's right that's a volcanic neck or plug and these are like spokes of a wheel coming off a lot of times you'll have radial vein structures coming off of these necks and plugs think of uh it coming up and as it's protruding out like spokes on a wheel you have all these fracture zones, and then eventually those are filled with hydrothermal fluids. That's why I always tell you the magic rule is what? One, three, seven, and 21. Now, if you don't know what that is, stay to the end of the video, and I'll explain what those magic numbers are to finding gold around those volcanic necks and plugs. It's got some depth to it. Look at that. Barn owl living in there somewhere. Got a little cut right there on the side. You see that? Right up there against that andesite, that green andesite. Beautiful looking vein. Look how wide it swells out. It gets up to about six, seven feet wide. Now, I already went ahead and I ran this particular mine site through mindat.org and, of course, through the MRDS. If you don't know what those are, you really need to research that. I'll leave links down below so you can check it out. But as this mine and the other mines on this particular vein structure went down, the values got richer because as they come up to the surface, a lot of the mineralization is leached out. A lot of this stuff on the top is referred to as bowl quartz. It's not worth anything. But as you go down, the values are better, the grades increase. And this one, and the ones along this structure, at the very lowest depths, reach three ounce per ton. And that's native gold too, that's not sulfides. And look at this stope over here. This is what I'm talking about. See where they went ahead and they stoked out that entire vein structure? There's the hanging wall, and that's the foot wall. Hanging walls, you can always tell because they're slanted in and foot walls are slanted away. But this one's got some good depth to it. There's another one up the way that's got even more depth and they pulled out even more gold. All right, I'm going to show you a simple way to sample for free mill gold in these hard rock mines. And then I'll cover other techniques if you guys want to get more involved and more in depth in it. If you plan on working your own hard rock mine. All right, this is the first clue. See that? Anybody out there know what that is? All right, well, if you don't know what it is, I'll tell you. Most people think it's just a wooden post in the ground. It's not. That's important for when you're gonna be sampling these hard rock mines. This is part of an old trestle system. Now, if I have a mine right there and I need to get my waste rock over here, I need to build a bridge, a trestle, if you will. And most of your mines that are on the sides of hills or in the mountains, they'll build a trestle from the portal or the shaft entrance, the collar, out and away. And they'll slowly start dumping and dumping and dumping until they get to the very end of that trestle. When they do, they'll build another trestle. This is the end of a trestle right here. And there's posts like this all over because you can see where they ran it out so far, stopped, built another trestle, so on and so forth. There's another one right here. The second post is gone. 
but it would be part of the trestle like a bridge system and then they could wheel their ore cars all the way out then dump and then head back now why are these important why am i telling you this it's real simple because when you go to sample these mine dumps you're going to need to know where they stopped that will be the lowest point remember what i told you about the quartz that's towards the surface on these fissure filling vein structures a lot of it towards the surface isn't going to have any values in it it can but most often it doesn't it's already been leached out over thousands if not millions of years so you need to go down well if you want to come out here and see what they were getting you need to go to the end of the run that they were digging when they were down in that shaft or inside that adit so you're going to go to the very ends of these guys and you're going to trench sample i'll show you what i'm talking about what you're looking for is indicators a lot of this quartz out here is milky white it has no mineralization in it so it looks like waste rock but if you see any reds or browns or dark staining inside of that material then you know you're on a winner so here i got a piece of trachyte which is in the andesite family there ain't gonna be nothing in that that's the country rock out here here i got some porphyry which is altered andesite basically what's happened is hydrothermal fluids have come in and they've altered it into this you're going to see a lot of that in waste rock piles because sometimes gold will be in there and of course you can't see it but there's actually a dike that's coming off of this guy a feeder dike as they call it and it there's actually several of them that come in the area and that's important because it heating up those fluids and getting them to circulate that's very important you got to get that fluid on the move as it goes through it saturates the rock and it can either fill in the voids with mineralization or it can actually pull it out of the rock and carry it along with it so it's very important to have some type of a system that heats it up feeder dikes are great for that and you'll see that a lot in depositions well like i said what i like to do is i like to go to the very ends of the trestles and i'll do a trench straight across and i'm going to do that today i'll trench here i'll trench there anywhere it looks like it's the, at the end of a run Now you don't have to go very deep maybe a foot is the most you have to do you see this basaltic material that came from the dike system radiating off of that volcanic plug i really don't think there's going to be any gold in here but i have seen systems like up in washington where the gold was found right up against those basaltic dikes if you will now most of the time i'll put bags in between sandbags to differentiate where i'm pulling this at but if i'm just going out to do a quick grab sample or trench sample i'll just throw it all in one bucket and then i'll mark the bucket where it came from and if i find any values whatsoever then i can go back and be more specific about it yeah you can tell it's an old mine look how small that hole is and look at the pattern while you're around the portal of either the added or the shaft around the collar look for their high grade piles now if the mine was small enough and didn't have an ore bin chances are they would sack it up right there at the portal or the collar of the shaft it'll be easy to spot because you'll see a pile of rocks that don't look like they belong there and what you're going to do is called a grab sample you're just going to grab a couple of the rocks that look like they have the most mineralization in them and you can take those back crush them down and check to see if there's any values in that especially if the mine shut down prior to world war ii because of executive order l208 that means that the ore never got a chance to make it to the mill which is good news for you to make things profitable it has to be one ounce per ton or higher if you're in it just for fun then you can go down as far as a quarter ounce per ton you see where i have a basaltic dike right here let's see how many of you out there can figure this out what is that i've got fragments of andesite in there see that sharp angular fragments what do you think that is now i know most of you are going to say oh jeff that's caliche it's not caliche sonny jim there's another dike right here now i'm showing you this right now because right here this is a good spot to find gold placer gold in these little nooks and crannies right in here you see that this would be a great place to run a vac pack anywhere where it's rough and angular like this the gold can get stuck in these little tiny fractures and this is perfect because it's running perpendicular to the wash see that 
So as the gold is flowing over, boom, it gets stuck while the lighter material or the flow sand blows on by. So these are great areas to check. And if you're a good prospector like I know you are, you should already know all this stuff. But I'm just going over it for the people who might not be familiar with it. Now, if you know where these steps go, leave me a comment down below. Where do they go? Somebody put a lot of work into these steps. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, the steps are gone. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? Oh, what's that? What is that? Look at all those basaltic flows right above my head. Now, look at this, right out of the rock. Isn't this cool? Oh, look at that, all that water. Oh, look inside, I got, looks like goldfish are in there. Yeah, look at that goldfish, right there, see him? There's that goldfish. Got bees everywhere, ooh, I hate bees. Got a whole bunch of water seeping out of the rocks back behind me. There's a natural aquifer inside of this mountain. It comes out right here, and somebody has taken the time to build up this wall, this retaining wall, so the water can seep out. And then the water fills up that little pool right there. And somebody's populated it with some type of goldfish. All right, I'm gonna go teach you some more geology, so keep them pants on, okay? You see that formation over there? Right there, you see it? Do you know what that is, huh? I'm gonna give you a second to figure it out. It should be a no-brainer, just look at it. No? All right, that's called ash flow tough. Basically, that's the ash that came out of this volcanic system, this ridge here, there's a fault underneath us. That came out first, so it's lowest. And you can see how it's soft and it weathers away and leaves all those pot marks and caves. But I wanted you to see that because you're going to see that a lot. And sometimes you'll actually see fragments of the surrounding country rock locked in there from the initial explosion. So that was pyroclastic flow at one time. And you can see all the different layers or, or bedding planes of it. All right, I know, I know. Get on to checking out what's in that bucket, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I want to teach you some geology along the way. I think it's important. And what do we have over here? Look at that. That's an old tertiary channel up there. In the middle of the desert. That's the stuff dreams are made of right there. Look at that. And the rocks down here are very important because this will give you an idea of where all this stuff came from. Take a look at this. All right, see that rock? That's quartz monzonite. That's grit granite. You can see the, the pink K spars in there. And it's got a little bit of horn blend in there. There's some more granite right there. You can see a lot of plagioclass in that. The other one had a ton of K spars, the pink K spars. So what does that tell me? Oh, and there's some greenstone right there too. Look at that. It's got a lot of olivine in it. Look at that. There's one there, there's one there. What that tells me is that a lot of this material was transported from a long distance away. Because the closest mountains that have any type of geology like this are miles and miles away. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get at the lowest contact zones of that old channel and any bedrock that we can find. I don't see any bedrock but we'll sample the best we can. Then we'll take that with us and pan it out. So let's get up there and take a look. Oh, uh -huh, there's some basalt right there. See the basalt? Yeah, look at that. Tons of granitic rock. Look at all that. There's your ultra mafix, your greenstone right there. And see this? This is the bottom of the contact zone right here. And then you got this really fine material. So this was laid down onto that. This is what drift mining is all about. You get under these old tertiary channels, river channels. They call them tertiary channels because of the time period that they were in, the tertiary period. What they do is they would cut down through all this material and they would try to get down to the very bottom, the bedrock, where this is sitting on. 
gold is always going to find its way down to the bottom because it's so heavy. It's 19.3 times heavier than water and it'll settle down. I'm going to scoop out real quick right here at the very bottom of the contact zone. And that's what you should be doing too if you find these old river channels. Whether they're out in the middle of the desert or if they're in California because California is known for them. That's what the old timers were using the monitors that you see. And what they were doing is they were washing away tons and tons of ash flow that was sitting on top of the old river channels. That's why they were doing that. And then once they got down to the river channels, they'd hit hard pack. They'd wash that down into these giant sluice boxes. Now, if the hard pack is down there long enough, it'll actually turn blue, have like a blue hue to it. And that's why the old timers used to call it the blue lead, but it's super tough. You got to literally drill and blast, or if you got a hose that can put out 10,000 pounds of pressure. Now I didn't bring another bucket, so I'm going to have to use the gold pan. Look at that. Oh, nice. Nice looking material. This is very similar to what we're doing in the drift mine. We hope they don't collapse. All right, that's enough. Just a sample. All right, let's go pan it out and see what we got. Nice big one. Look at that. Oh, that might even be worth sampling. I got some green schist up there. See the green schist? Right there. That's green schist. Here's a nice vein right here running in between the green schist and that granitic rock. Green schist, which has got olivine in it. Granitic rock, and I see reds and pinks. Oh, I could walk out of here for weeks. I love it. All right, now let's talk about basalt again. Basalt and diabase. Basalt has a fine grain mass because it cooled rapidly more so than diabase, but they're very similar in their same family. But the point is this, is if you find dikes of basalt or even column basalt, look for intrusions next to it. That could be granite, granite diorite, serpentine. You want to look at the contact zones of that basalt and that particular rock type. Why is that important? because it's at these contact zones where you can find mineralization. And of course, mineralization means the potential for gold deposition. So that's why it's important why I'm covering basalt and diabase so much. And a good example of that is up in Washington State around Liberty. So, and if you haven't seen that video, I'll leave a link down below. Now on a side note, green schist is green because of the amount of chlorite that it has in it. And it can also have epidote in it, which leads to it being green. Now in my other videos, you've probably heard me talk highly about chlorite, gold deposition and green schist because of chlorite. And you'll find the gold deposition in the foliation of the metamorphic rock. But that's for another subject. And no, I haven't forgot about those numbers, three, seven, and 21. Actually it's one, three, seven, and 21. Those are the magic numbers that we're going to talk about at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. So we're going to do this one first. This is the material that came out of that tertiary channel. Then we'll do this one second. I've already got a tub of water here. Don't forget the jet dry. The reason why is that jet dry will break up the surface tension of this water. And it'll keep that gold from floating on top, the super fine gold. And I know you guys are waiting for it, so I'm going to say it. And yeah, you're going to get wet. Now, I'm not going to classify this first one. I'll classify that one. Look at all that. Ooh, olivine. Tons of olivine. Remember how I taught you the gold pan? Stratify your material. And I might have to tilt that. Get some more water on the other end, like that. There we go. Like you're kneading dough. Don't forget to get wet. And lightly wash it out. Now, I don't know if there's going to be anything in this. I remember last time I was there, there was a lot of gold coming out of that tertiary channel. And I'll tell you some more details about it later. All right, here we go. 
getting down to the nitty gritty. Get that out of the way. Get my, oh yeah, there's gold in there. Look at that. I don't know if you can see it. See those little specks right up in there? Isn't that nice? Not a lot, but that's a good indicator right there. And some black sand. There you go. Tap that up a little bit. Couple specks in there. Little tiny ones too. Not too shabby, huh? That is really good, actually. That's not bad at all. And yeah, I haven't forgot about the one, three, seven, and 21. So you can just forget about that. I'll tell you in a minute. All right, now. This guy right here, I'm gonna classify because I got some really big chunks in there. One other thing I gotta emphasize before I get into this. Make sure that gold pan is clean in between your samples. You don't want to cross contaminate from one sample to the next. I've seen a million guys do it out there. Even guys who've been doing this for a long time, seasoned prospectors. They get all excited. They don't get every speck out and they think that the next one has gold in it. And then they invest a ton of money in an area that has no gold. So make sure that that pan is nice and clean, got it? All right, here we go. I like to classify wet. And I suggest you do the same thing. It makes it so, so much easier. Look at all that beautiful quartz coming out of there. See that? Put him on the side just in case of specimens. Next one. I like taking the classifier and rotating it back and forth. It helps sift the material down. Man, that is some heavy, heavy material. And I've also noticed that when I go riding around out in the desert, all the gold drops to the bottom of this, this five gallon bucket. And I've seen a lot of guys, they'll pan the top They'll get frustrated because they don't see any gold. They throw the rest of it out thinking no gold in that bucket. Gold is funny that way. Give it just a little movement, it'll drop to the bottom of anything. Oh, that's nice. That's altered andesite right there. I like that. You see that altered andesite? A lot of guys call that porphyry. Yeah. Good indicator for gold. The miners of the old days used to say porphyry carries gold and they would chase the porphyry. All right, I think that's a full pan. What do you think? All right, now the fun part, panning it out. All right, get some more water to the end. chunks let 
Just a lot of chunks, look at that. Now, real quick, a lot of people ask me, Jeff, why do you guys classify before you gold pan? It's real simple, it comes down to two things, density and displacement. If you have two objects in your gold pan that are the same exact size, one is gold and one is just country rock or overburden. If they're the same size, because of gold's density, it'll displace everything else when you wash it around in the pan. It's 19.3 times heavier than anything else in that pan. So what happens is when you stratify the material, shaking the pan, all the heavies like gold and black sand drop to the bottom. The lighter material, if it's all the same size, when you go to wash that material out, this will easily come to the top and float right out and you'll wash it out. Everything that's heavier will stay down on the bottom. That's why you classify before you gold pan. If I have a little tiny speck of gold, and I got a big rock in there. Imagine how much water it's gonna to take to move this rock when I'm gold panning. And this gold will easily be washed away by that much force that I'm using to wash out all the overburden. So that is why you classify. All right. I know, I know, get on with it. Now I'm working with load gold, so I'm gonna need a jeweler's loop, but let me do a quick inspect. Yep, yep, I got gold. Oh, there's nothing like seeing gold in the pan. Hold on. Real tiny, tiny gold. Let me show it to you. I got one little speck there where my finger is and I got one little speck there where my finger is and there's a little tiny one there. Now, when you're inspecting load gold, always bring a jeweler's loop with you. I like using a 10 times, you don't need anything stronger than that because sometimes you won't be able to see it with your naked eye. Now there's little, little tiny pieces of gold in there too that I couldn't see with my naked eye, but I can see with my jeweler's loop. And that's why it's very important when you're chasing gold, you carry a jeweler's loop, even with placer. So we got gold coming out of the load deposits and we got gold coming out of the old tertiary zones. All right, now I know you're chomping at the bit and you wanna know, Jeff, what is the deal with 137 and 21? It's real simple. When you're looking for any type of load deposits in a volcanic zones, especially out in Nevada, where you have a lot of epithermal deposits, I want you to localize some of your volcanic shields and cones. And then I want you to draw a circle around it. And then from that, go out one mile, three miles, seven miles, and 21 miles. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to overlay that map with a geological map. And you're gonna look for any type of intrusions that are in those zones. You're looking for anything that has to do with granite or granite diorite or serpentine. Just take my word on that, one, three, seven, and 21. Found a lot of gold deposits that way that were missed. And sometimes they're gonna be inches below the surface. So take a good quality VLF out there so you can scan because it's gonna be able to pick up things just below the surface that most people have missed or walked over. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. And if you do, I want you to smash that like button. Smash it hard. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already because I notice a lot of viewers out there, they watch the video, but they don't subscribe. So go ahead and subscribe. That really helps our channel grow. We can get more videos out there so more people can learn how to find gold. So anyway, I'm gonna get on out of here. It's getting late and I got rain coming in. It's monsoon season. So until next time, this is Jeff Williams and who? My name is Jeff. Yeah, that's me. Saying, you wanna find gold, but you're not sure what to do? Follow my simple tips and you'll be rolling in AU too. Take care, everybody. Oh, and before I get on out of here, I wanna let all my premium patrons know that we got a new shirt in stock and the fabric on these is fantastic. All right, let me know what you think about the new shirt. All right, let me get out of here because I got gold to find and I can't do it standing here jawjacking. All right, leave me be.